Get ready, because we've got some fascinating news. Donald Trump himself is talking about the rapture, and he says it's happening real soon. The former president dropped hints about a major event that's been a hot topic for ages. Curious to know more? Well, join us in this video to know what Trump has to say about the rapture. Trust us, it's something you won't want to miss. The concept of the rapture is a belief held by some Christians, especially in American evangelicalism. It's about an event at the end of times where all deceased Christian believers will rise from the dead. Together with the living Christians, they will ascend in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This belief comes from the first epistle to the Thessalonians in the Bible, using the Greek word harpazo, meaning to snatch away or to seize. The term rapture and the associated belief come from dispensational premillennialism, a specific way of understanding the end times. It's like a roadmap that suggests some prophecies in the Bible are yet to happen and will unfold in the future. This view emerged in the 1830s and is more commonly embraced by fundamentalist theologians in the United States. Also, the idea of the rapture, as we know it today, is relatively new in the history of Christianity. It started gaining attention in the 1830s and is not part of traditional Christian teachings. While the term is frequently used by fundamentalist theologians in the United States, it doesn't have a long-standing history in the broader scope of Christianity. There are different opinions about when the rapture will happen and whether it's a single event or two separate ones. One popular viewpoint is called pre-tribulationism. According to this belief, the rapture would occur before a seven-year period of tribulation. This tribulation would end with Christ's second coming, followed by a thousand-year messianic kingdom. This idea originated from the Bible translations analyzed by John Nelson Darby in 1833 and is widely accepted among Christians who believe in the rapture. However, there is some disagreement within evangelicalism. Some argue for a post-tribulation rapture, suggesting it happens after the tribulation period. Different Phases of Rapture According to this rapture belief, there are two main phases. The first involves a secret rapture at the beginning of a seven-year period of tribulation, during which the Antichrist will appear. The second phase occurs at the end of this tribulation, when Jesus returns to earth triumphantly. To understand the idea of the rapture, we look to Jesus' promise of returning to earth. In the Bible, Jesus reassured his followers, saying, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He spoke of preparing a place for them in his Father's house and intended to return for them. This promise is found in John chapter 14, verses 1 and 3. When examining these verses, Jesus doesn't explicitly mention whether his return will be secret or public. Those who advocate for the idea of the rapture interpret this as a secret event where believers are taken away, leaving others behind. However, the verses don't specify the manner of his return. To gain clarity on this, we turn to other Bible texts that provide more details on what will happen when Jesus returns. After Jesus' resurrection, the disciples witnessed his ascension into heaven. The Bible recounts this event in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 11. As they watched, a cloud received him out of their sight. Angels reassured the disciples that the same Jesus who ascended into heaven would return in the same manner. Two crucial points emerge. First, it emphasizes that the returning Jesus is the same Jesus who lived on earth. And second, his return will be in a similar visible manner as his ascension. Now, the question arises, is the concept of the rapture supported by the Bible? The verses from Acts highlight the consistency of Jesus' return with his ascension. Jesus didn't ascend secretly. He ascended visibly bodily, and the same is expected for his return. This challenges the notion of a secret rapture, as the biblical account points towards a visible and recognizable return. Is Jesus' second coming secret? As we delve deeper into the biblical narrative, Another crucial text sheds light on the nature of Jesus' return. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 emphatically declares that when Jesus returns, every eye on earth will witness his arrival. This stands in stark contrast to the notion of a secret coming. 
Matthew chapter 24. Verse 27 further emphasizes the visibility of Jesus' return, comparing it to the unmistakable flash of lightning that illuminates the entire sky. Multiple biblical references vividly portray the grandeur of Jesus' return. Matthew 16, 27 foretells his arrival in glory alongside heavenly angels. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17 envisions his return accompanied by the shout of the archangel and the trumpet blast of God. Revelation 6, 14 to 17 depicts a scene where the wicked see Jesus coming prompting desperate cries for the rocks and mountains to shield them from his presence. Revelation 19, 11, 16 casts Jesus as the triumphant King of Kings leading heavenly armies. These passages collectively dispel the notion of a secret return, portraying a majestic event visible to all. The very idea of angels, shouts, and trumpet blasts aligns with a public and awe-inspiring manifestation of Jesus' return. While 2 Peter 3.10 refers to the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night, it's crucial to unravel the true meaning of this analogy. Contrary to suggesting a secret snatch of the saved, the text emphasizes the heavens passing away with a great noise, a far cry from secrecy. First, Thessalonians 5.4.6 provides additional insight explaining that Jesus' coming as a thief in the night is unexpected only for those not watching and waiting for Him. His people, described as sons of light and day, are urged to stay vigilant and sober. This clarifies that the unexpected nature lies in the unpreparedness of those not anticipating His return, not in a covert arrival. In essence, these biblical passages dispel the idea of a secretive rapture. The imagery painted is one of grandeur, visibility, and a clear warning to remain vigilant. The biblical narrative consistently portrays Jesus' return as a spectacular event, contrasting the notion of an inconspicuous disappearance of the saved. Further moving on, what are the signs that indicate rapture is here? In the teachings of Jesus, specifically in Matthew 24-5 at 8, we find vital clues that hint at the approaching end times. This passage unfolds like a road map, revealing various indicators, such as the rise of false messiahs, wars, famines, and natural disasters that signal the onset of significant events. However, it is crucial to comprehend the nuanced warning within these verses. These occurrences signify the birth pains, not the conclusive end. The end is yet to come, urging us to remain vigilant and discerning. Among many, the prominence of the nation of Israel stands out as a paramount sign. The re-establishment of Israel as a sovereign state in 1948, after centuries of dispersion, aligns with biblical prophecies. The significance of Israel in the end times prophecy is reiterated through its role in eschatological texts like Daniel 10.14, 11.41, and Revelation 11-8. The genesis of Israel as a nation, stemming from God's promise to Abraham, shapes the prophetic landscape. God assured Abraham of everlasting possession in Canaan, Genesis 17-8, and Ezekiel prophesied Israel's physical and spiritual revival, Ezekiel 37. Therefore, the existence of Israel in its ancestral land is central to the end times prophecy as outlined in biblical passages that underscore its significance. One such sign is the appearance of the false Messiah. When Jesus' disciples inquired about His coming, they weren't asking about the end of the world. Instead, they sought to understand when Jesus would take control and reign. In Matthew 24, Jesus responds to their questions. He warns them to be cautious, as false Christ would emerge, claiming to be the Messiah and deceiving many. The reason behind this deception is unveiled in Matthew 24:24, 24, 24, where it's revealed that false Christs and prophets will perform remarkable signs and wonders through the power of Satan. It's a cautionary note. Miracles may happen, but true faith should not be built solely on them. A parallel warning is echoed in verse John 4:13, urging believers to test spirits and discern the authenticity of their origin. 
While seismic events, political turmoil, and conflicts involving Israel may appear as definitive signs of the end times, caution is advised. Every upheaval does not necessarily equate to the immediate arrival of the last days. The Apostle Paul underscores the prevalence of false teaching in the last days, emphasizing the need for discernment amid spiritual challenges. The times are labeled as perilous due to escalating evil and opposition to truth. With that, false prophets also come in place. More and more, there will be people who claim to speak for God, but they're not the real deal. False prophets can be religious leaders or anyone who confidently says, this is right and this is wrong. You can find them everywhere. The key sign of a false prophet is that they're all about themselves. They're not really interested in what God wants. A true prophet, on the other hand, speaks on behalf of God's interests, not their own. Another sign is the reconstruction of the Third Temple. Moreover, if they materialize, several markers could signal the unfolding of end-time events. These include the reconstruction of a Jewish temple in Jerusalem, heightened animosity towards Israel, and strides towards a global government. The preparation is underway. And recently, on October 12th, a special ancient water ceremony took place in Jerusalem. During this event, priests and musicians led the way from Shahar Hashpat to Shiloh, Siloam Springs, an important historical location. At each stop, people joyfully sang, danced, and played silver trumpets, following the guidance of respected rabbis. Upon reaching Shiloh, they gathered water in a golden jug and brought it back to the mountaintop. They recreated a model altar using leafy branches, similar to the old temple days. The ceremony concluded with blessings and something known as hakel, a unique event that occurs every seven years. While the Torah doesn't specifically require water libation, it has become a cherished tradition everyone celebrates. In ancient times, this ceremony lasted 15 hours in the temple and continued throughout the night. People worldwide joined the Sukkot celebrations, transforming it into a significant day of worship. During the final six days of Sukkot, the water libation and pouring of wine were performed, preserving the traditions of the temple. Next are wars and rumors. Addressing the disciples' concerns, Jesus foretells a world plagued by wars and rumors of wars. Despite these conflicts, Jesus instructs his followers not to be troubled, emphasizing that these events must transpire before the end. The promise of peace, often falsely proclaimed by leaders, will only be realized with the arrival of Jesus, the ultimate Prince of Peace. The reality of our world today reflects the accuracy of these predictions. Terrorism, bombings, assassinations, and sabotage persist. Jesus' words suggest that humanity, left to its own devices, will not attain lasting peace until his return. Also, there are natural disasters in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7 and 8. Continuing the discourse, Jesus mentions natural disasters, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes, as signs of the approaching end times. Described as the beginning of sorrows or birth pains, these events will increase in frequency and intensity, much like labor pains. The analogy illustrates the gradual escalation leading up to significant events, urging believers to recognize these signs. The prevalence of natural disasters today aligns with these biblical prophecies, signaling the unfolding of a predetermined plan. While humanity grapples with the consequences of such events, believers are encouraged to view them as precursors rather than isolated occurrences. Persecution for His Name in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 In this verse, Jesus predicts a time when His followers will face tribulation, persecution, and even death for His name's sake. The hostility towards Christians in the last days will stem from their association with Jesus. It is not a general opposition to religion, but a specific aversion to the name of Jesus. This prediction resonates with the contemporary world, where expressions of faith are tolerated to a certain extent as long as the name of Jesus is kept at bay. The prophecy prepares believers for a reality where their commitment to Jesus may incur animosity, emphasizing the importance of standing firm in their faith despite external pressures. 
Next comes apostasy in Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. As times get tougher, some people will get upset, betray each other, and even start hating one another. This is called apostasy, which means turning away from the teachings of the Bible and the honor of Christ. The Apostle John once explained this by saying that some who seemed like they belonged to the group of believers would leave. These departures reveal that they never truly belonged because they would have stuck around if they did. Many churches today focus on being user-friendly, avoiding strong teachings about redemption, Christ's lordship, repentance, and everlasting punishment. When challenges come, people in these churches might leave because they never really knew Christ in the first place. Depravity in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. Things will get worse. The world will become more lawless. Just look at the news and you'll see the crime rate going up. With more wrongdoing, love will start to fade away. Trusting strangers is hard because there's so much dishonesty and sin. Why is there so much lawlessness? False prophets play a big role by saying there's no clear right or wrong. When people believe there's no absolute standard, everything falls into chaos, and humanity heads toward a mess of filth and debauchery. Preaching of the gospel, as in Matthew chapter 24, verses 13 and 14. Even in these tough times, some people will stick with their love for Jesus. They'll hold on to the truth and declare, Jesus Christ is Lord. People don't endure to be saved, they endure because they are saved. While signs like apostasy, false prophets, and depravity have always been around, the climax of it all is when the gospel, the good news about Jesus, is preached all over the world. The Bible doesn't say everyone will be saved, but it does say that once the message reaches all nations, that's when the end will come. It's like the grand finale, marking a significant moment in the unfolding of God's plan. Understanding these signs, what message did Donald Trump deliver for rapture? Former U.S. President Donald Trump recently spoke to Christians, emphasizing the significance of Jesus Christ, particularly in connection to the concept of rapture. He reflected on a moment over 2,000 years ago when an angel announced the joyous birth of Jesus to shepherds in Bethlehem. Trump conveyed a powerful message about the current state of America, asserting that the nation requires a savior. However, he humbly clarified that he is not that savior, recognizing a higher authority. In his words, our country needs a savior right now, and our country has a savior, and it's not me. He pointed to Jesus Christ as the true Savior. Trump credited the church and Jesus for pivotal moments in history despite his concerns. He highlighted the transformative influence of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, asserting that it has profoundly shaped the world. Trump noted, And it's impossible to think of the life of our own country without the influence of his example and of his teachings. Trump believed that Jesus Christ played a crucial role in various aspects of America's history, including overcoming the Civil War, ending slavery, defeating communism and fascism, and contributing to significant scientific discoveries. He underlined Jesus as the ultimate source of strength and hope, declaring, And we have to remember that Jesus Christ is the ultimate source of our strength and of our hope, here and everywhere, and for all time. What do we need to do during rapture? The rapture is on the horizon, and the good news is that getting ready for it is simpler than you might think. It all boils down to one key thing, accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. The rapture is specifically for those who believe in Jesus. In the Bible, there's a clear prophecy about the rapture, and it goes like this. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. It continues, saying the Lord will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God. Then those who have already died believing in Christ will rise first. After that, those who are still alive will be taken up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And guess what? We'll be with the Lord forever. This message encourages believers. 
1 Thessalonians 4 to 15 to 18. Here's the deal. Those who have accepted Jesus as their Savior are ready for the rapture. The unsaved, those who haven't embraced Jesus, are not ready. The day of the Lord, which kicks off with the rapture, will catch the unsaved off guard like a thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 5.2. Those left behind in the rapture are the ones without the Spirit of Christ living in them. But here's the good news for believers. You, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief, 1 Thessalonians 5.4. Believers are like the five wise virgins in one of Jesus' stories. They are ready because they have faith in Him. In the story, these wise virgins have lamps with enough oil, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, not everyone on earth will have this kind of faith. The time before Jesus returns will be marked by spiritual coldness and unbelief. Jesus himself wondered if, when he comes back, he will find faith in the earth. Luke 18.8 In light of the signs of raptures and Trump's message, believers are urged to exercise wisdom and discernment rather than hastily interpreting isolated events as definitive indicators of the imminent end times. While God has provided ample information to prepare us, the emphasis is on readiness and vigilance. As our hearts echo the sentiment, Come, Lord Jesus, Revelation 22:20. 20, the call is not for undue speculation, but for steadfast faith and preparedness. So what do you think of the message by Donald Trump for rapture? Comment below and subscribe for more.